Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today, and welcome to the latest session in our series of workshops and interviews. My name is Pamela Robertson, Program Manager for the SPIE AR VR MR conference taking place in March of 2021. Today, we'll be hearing the latest on laser beam scanning for near eye display applications from key players in the industry. And I would very much like to thank all of our speakers today for joining us. They're joining us from all over the globe. We have them in Finland, Taiwan, Japan, Germany, and the US. So yes, lots of time zones, and I so appreciate everybody accommodating the different times and making it today. And thank you everybody for joining us in the audience, and uh, I'm just so glad you're here. Before we start, I'd just like to go over a little bit of housekeeping. Okay, so just so you know, and I think you saw it before, this is sessions being recorded, and the link will be on the website probably early next week. So just check back and look on the website, not only for the recording, but other upcoming events that we have coming up. There's, we have uh, sessions going on all the way from today up until March, uh, workshops and interviews. So going back here. Okay, so now I'd like to introduce the chair and creator of this important workshop. He has vast experience in consumer electronics from his positions at Dolby, Panavision, Microvision, and Toshiba. He's currently Director of Strategic Marketing Development at ST Microelectronics. I'd like to welcome Barath Rajgrove Plamen. Oh, I'm sorry. Over to you, Barath. Thank you. No worries. Thank you so much. Uh, let me get my video up here and running. Um, okay, start video. You got Great. it. Great. Can you hear me, Pam? Is that, am I clear? Yep. Great. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Pamela. I appreciate it. And uh, and first of all, you know, th th thanks to you, Pamela, and SPIE, for uh, for uh, you know hosting this uh, event and uh, inviting us to discuss laser beam scanning solutions for NEI display. So we really appreciate it. And like you, I want to um, you know, second you in thanking um, thanking our panelists as well uh, and our speakers from all over the world. So much appreciated uh, their participation. Um, and also, I want to also thank you know Bernard and Christoph as well for their guidance in this. So again, it's been a really collaborative effort, and really enjoy working with SPIE, and we're looking looking forward to this event, as well as looking forward to the conference next year. Um, and also, of course, all of you in the, out there listening to this, thank you for your participation. Without which this wouldn't be possible. So thank you so much. So so with that, uh, let me go ahead and start share my screen and start um, start the uh, presentation. Very good. So uh, is this coming through, uh, Pamela? You're good. Great. Wonderful. Great. So thank you again. Uh, my name is Bharath Rajagopalan, and as Pamela mentioned, I'm the Director, to, the director of Strategic Marketing at ST Mac Electronics. And uh, I'm really pleased here today with, uh, with uh, my speakers and colleagues to talk to you about laser beam scanning for near to displays. So let me give you a quick synopsis of what we hope to cover today in today's session. Uh, really, the idea of today's session is only an hour and a half long, and uh, this topic is so rich and dense, we can spend hours, if not days, talking about it. But the idea today is just to give you a little snippet or snapshot of the seminar and workshop that we have scheduled for next March. And so this is sort of a teaser event, if you will, an appetizer for the main course, which will be next year. And hopefully it'll whet your appetite to engage more, learn more, and, and certainly uh, come next year uh, for the workshop. Uh, this, this is all about laser beam scanning. And, and what we want to really focus on today are the key technologies and solutions that enable uh, all the wearable AR devices, which is the holy grail that uh, the industry has been discussing for many, many years now. And as we, as we come to a position where a lot of technologies are maturing, uh, it is time right now to start to put together the various disparate components and think about the holistical framework under which they can come together in a system integration uh, uh, system integration uh, framework, as well as looking at all the manufacturing aspects to make this a reality. Um, you know, one of the things that you'll find through the course of today's discussion is, is the need and the importance for monolithic design, 
holistic design systems view, because very often a lot of the focus has been on individual component, individual device or individual technology. And what's really left out is looking at the entire system that has come together in order to enable a lot of the key characteristics that, are, that, that, that drives AR glasses. And really to make all that happen, it's also critical and important to have an ecosystem as well. And uh, I'll share with you later on a recent press release that a lot of you probably saw uh, to really talk about the fact that above and beyond having technology, above and beyond having solutions, it's also important to have an ecosystem and a platform which can be then offered to the marketplace to help uh, build and drive and grow and catalyze this market. So with that, uh, let's go into more details now. So, you know, the goal again is, is, is you, know, you know, what's called you know, head up, hands free, all day wearable devices. And they wear about glasses. That is the holy grail. At the end of the day, you know, we want something that looks like what I'm wearing right now. That is, you know, that is not uh, that looks like any of the glasses, but has all the really advanced technologies that allows for augmenting information on the physical world. Uh, and some of the key things in order to enable uh, utility of these kind of devices and these kind of applications. Um, are, are, are these factors over here. This is not the exhaustive list by any means, but these are some of the key criteria that's important in order to facilitate uh, all day wearable glasses. Certainly we want this to be indoor outdoor use um, for maximum utility. And what that really means is that the peak brightness uh, coming to the eye needs to be really in excess of 1500 candelas per square meter or nits. What that really means is that it allows you to have glasses that are less tinted, more transparent, than going to a sunglass type of a, type of a, a type of a device. Um, certainly, the form factor is absolutely crucial and critical. Uh, a lot of you probably saw the recent announcement between Facebook and Las Laurel Exotica, talking about their collaborations on, on smart glasses for the future, uh, and that really highlights the importance of, uh, of fashion and form, and that's absolutely vital. And I think you know, when you start designing these kind of systems, you got to start thinking about the end and working your way backwards. So from fashion back to hardware and software and technology, uh, power is obviously important. Clearly. And really, you know, in order to make it, in order to make this viable, uh, cost-effective weight and and and, uh, and size, uh, it has to really be less than one watt. That's total system power. That is the optics, photonics, the electronics, the sensors, everything uh, needs to really uh, be under that envelope. Um, the weight's critical, of course, uh, as you wear this. Uh, glasses all day long. If you're much above 70 grams, you start to put a lot of pressure on the bridge of your nose, start to get headaches. So it's really important to uh, manage the weight as well. Uh, latency, you know, uh, by latency, I'm talking about motion to photon latency, uh, particularly for immersive applications like XR and MR, uh, you need to be, you know, really under four milliseconds. AR is more forgiving. It's not as critical. Uh, but as we get into the holy grail of a fully immersive environment, uh, latency becomes extremely important. Field of view. Field of view is very interesting. You know, a lot of people talk about field of view. Uh, I think it's really important to talk about applications in terms of field of view. Uh, we believe, and a lot of our customers, and a lot of our partners believe, that when you separate augmented reality from MR and XR, I'm talking about applications where symbols, symbology, text, graphics, overlay informatics, if you will, kind of uh, application versus a fully immersive holographic rendering uh, type of application, field of view is very different. And so certainly for a simple AR, for, if I can call it that, smart glasses, if you will, uh, 30 to 40 degree diagonal field of view is more than enough. Any larger, it's unusable for the, for the application, quite frankly. Um, certainly, if we want to go immersive, it's absolutely important to have a very large field of view, at least 80 degrees, if not, if not larger, uh, so that you can have a much more immersive and a realistic uh, interactions uh, with, uh, with the media and the content around you. A uh, likewise of resolution as well, uh, you know, again, in depending on application, uh, resolution will dictate. Uh, again, for AR, again, symbology, text, graphics, overlay, 720p is more than adequate. Uh, you actually don't need more than that. Uh, but certainly when you go into an immersive environment, uh, you know, 1440p is a minimum. You should probably be much higher than that in order to have the highest visual uh, fidelity uh, possible for the, for the rendering of, the, uh, of these images in, uh, in, uh, in the virtual space. 
And lastly, but not uh, least, is the IBOX size. Uh, you know, given the large range of variations of the IPD or the interpupillary distance, uh, a large IBOX is important in order to mitigate uh, the number of SKUs you have and or mitigate the need for any kind of adjustments for IPD on the glasses. And so uh, being greater than 10 millimeter uh, is certainly really important criteria in that regard. So those are some of the requirements. Uh, again, there are more, but at a top level, these are some of the key things that need to come together that really drives our technology selection choices, as well as integration schema and the overall design. So laser beam, how does that fit into, how does that fit into it? Well, it fits in quite nicely. Uh, should be no surprise to you to hear, hear me say that. Uh, it fits in really nicely for the near-to-eye display for several reasons. Uh, number one, you know, size matters, and in this case, uh, the smaller the better. And the laser beam scan uh, uh, type of uh, display device or micro displays uh, gives you very small form factors. Uh, these, these typically use a MEMS micro mirrors for laser beam scanning. So down below, you'll see some images and pictures of what they look like. On the bottom left-hand side, you'll see the US one cent coin. And next to it is the MEMS die. This is an example of a uh, electromagnetic uh, actuated uh, mirror die. And then right above it is the MEMS package uh, because it's electromagnetically actuated. It has magnets. Uh, but of course, the other uh, actuation schema, which allows for different kinds of packaging. Uh, next to it, but in the quarter, is a fully packaged optical light engine. Uh, you see the uh, flexible PCB connections for both the laser module as well as for the uh, MEMS. Um, and that is a Pico projector engine. Even though it's small, size of a quarter, it's still too big for uh, for near to eye for glasses. Uh, so my colleague Mark later will talk about uh, you know what's new in the horizon that we can share in terms of uh, a small form factors that can enable for near to eye. And then how it works, uh, as you can see in the little diagram below, it's very simple. You have three uh, illumination sources of uh, light sources, uh, blue, green, and red uh, lasers. Uh, as you know, as you can imagine, these are all edge mating lasers, therefore have a very high divergence angle. So they need to be collimated through a set of collimating lenses. And the beams need to be combined so they're collinear and overlap and they go through a dichroic element or com beam, com beam combiners, hits the MEMS mirror, the mirror scans, uh, back and forth, either uh, you have one, two, two 1D mirrors or one 2D mirror to do the full roster scan. So that's the operating principle of a laser beam scan uh, device. As I mentioned, you know, in order to get the size, you start with the MEMS, but you also have to have very small illumination sources. And so as so Ajams here on the talk about, you know, advanced laser diode packaging that enables very small form factor, very efficient uh, laser diode packaging that can support these applications. Uh, between those two, we can generate well over a million nits, which is uh, really important to have that kind of uh, excess overhead of optical power as you have the various losses to the system. Uh, the overall system, we can drive less than less than a watt uh, with, with such a configuration. And then certainly, you know, at the end, you have to have an imaging source. You have to image in, some, in the imaging plane. And so, you know, uh, trying to have a very small form factor glasses, lightweight glasses, uh, using other diffractive or holographic optical element uh, is a very good choice to do that and to couple into the uh, optical output from the uh, optical light engine. And so uh, Dispolex will be here and Applied Materials here to talk about um, to talk about uh, you know, how that couples into a wave of technology. And then, and then finally, you know, uh, we'll talk a little bit more detail about the different kind of actuation schema that's available to, uh, for laser beam scanning. So, you know, design considerations. And this is, I wanna spend a little bit of time here. And this is really important. <clears throat> what we are finding, we talked to a lot of people in the market, a lot of people in, uh, in, uh, in the industry, is that you know, people tend to focus on one thing. Uh, in terms of optimization. And, and this is a very complicated problem as a lot of you can probably appreciate, imagine. And this, this example diagram, this radar or spider web diagram here, just illustrates the fact that you have to, you know, simultaneously uh, optimize uh, multiple domains over here, right? Brightness, size, power, resolution, so on and so forth. And these all interact, as you can well imagine. And so trade-offs have to be made very, very carefully and you're not gonna get everything. It's just not gonna happen that way. So it's really important to have a bespoke design, if you will, or if you will, a holistic design, monolithic design that takes into account all these considerations under the framework of the op application. So the application will determine where you need to be and where, what you're willing to trade off and what penalty you pay or what benefits you, 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 uh, you receive from there. So for example, as I said earlier, in the case of simple AR, we have text symbology and graphical overlay, you know, talking about a 30 to 40 degree field of view, 10 millimeter eye box, 
greater than a thousand nits and so on and so forth. They can read uh, all the specs there. And that'll then determine basically how it'll optimize for the different parameters of the system and get to the kind of design that you'd want uh, that'll make for a very appealing and uh, sellable product in the marketplace. Conversely, when you then look at a different application and when you go to a fully immersive experience in holographic rendering, then you talk about a different set of characteristics. And there, brightness is important, but not as critical because a lot of, you know, a lot of the use cases are indoor typically for now anyway. And so we can you know, get away with founded nits or at least tint or you know, tint your, uh, uh, tint your uh, uh, optical waveguide elements uh, or your lenses. Uh, and certainly the weight's important. You don't want to be too heavy, um, but certainly not as driven to be eyeglass type, rather HMD types that can, you know, sacrifice some weight, and, uh, but you got to be under 200 grams, for example, and that allows some flexibility in the trade off of design as well. And the point here is, is that, you know, again, I just want to emphasize that it's really, really important to design the system and then work your, way back, work your way back down into the very components and the architecture, not the other way around. And the nice thing about laser beam scanning, uh, we believe is that at least from the power form factor, um, bright scalability, and a lot of other parameters, uh, we believe the laser beam scanning can address a lot of these constraints and give a lot of, uh, a lot of knobs to turn uh, for, the, uh, for the design of the end product. And finally, uh, it takes a village to do this, right? And so uh, we, we are pleased to announce to you the LBS ecosystem. You know, some of you may have seen it, some of you may, of you may not, but we really see, we recently announced uh, the la a laser alliance. So laser stands for laser scanning for augmented reality. Uh, it's an alliance consortium of companies. Uh, the members here are the founding members of this. And the idea really here is to make it easy for companies to go ahead and develop products. Uh, these are very complicated. Every piece of the puzzle is very, very complicated. So our goal is to work holistically amongst ourselves in order to develop the technology platforms, the technology framework, uh, develop uh, you know, uh, interface schema and mechanisms, uh, and even business models uh, to enable you know, anyone who desires to, be, to build HMDs or AR glasses. And that's a no say alliance. And so the key elements that came together, the illumination sources, the, the imaging, the waveguides, uh, also the end products, which you talked about earlier, you have, you, know, you have people like Mega One who have to then take all these components and, 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 and put it to a optical light engine. And then that they then get, gets put into an overall, um, overall end product. And so Quanta, for example, you know, is a world leader in developing a whole range of end products. Uh, and so you have to really bring all these pieces together in order to drive the marketplace. So our goal is to facilitate as much as we can, to the extent that we can, uh, offer the ecosystem and facilitate, uh, you know, a much lower, lower frictional path to allow for uh, various, uh, various players in the industry uh, to go to market. Uh, you will see two empty boxes here for OEMs and application processors. Uh, suffice it to say, we're talking to a lot of different people. Uh, OEMs, we cannot put their names. There are OEMs for those who, not, who don't know the vernacular or the end customers, end branded customers. Uh, you know, a lot of them don't want to talk about their plans right now, so that'll be a white box sometime for sure. But application process is very, very important. So you'll see that box being filled in pretty soon. And uh, you know, what I want to close it with is that the more partners to come, we're open to. Others as well. This is not. This is this is open society, not a closed society. So, um, you know, join the alliance. Uh, you know, and, and come learn more about us. We'd love to engage with you, and uh, we really look forward to you know engaging with you. And uh, you know, as the days and months go by, and uh, next year at the. Um, at the, uh, at the full event, we'll have a much deeper full day discussion uh, from, from all the people here on this call, uh, as well as others to talk about uh, all aspects of the laser beam scanning for uh, near eye display. So with that, I want to be sensitive of time. I want to then turn over uh, to my friend and colleague, uh, Marco Angelici is the director of macro actuation at HTML Electronics. Uh, he's responsible. He's responsible for, among other things, uh, the developing uh, the, the business around uh, MEMS micro mirrors. And so he'll go into more detail about the MEMS micro mirrors, how they work, what's what's out there, and and tease you about uh, some of the some of the developments that uh, that we are engaging with. So with that, Marco, let me turn it over to you. Thank you, Bharat. Thank you for passing the torch to me. Let me uh, show my presentation. So tell me if you can see it. Share it. OK. 
Can you see it? Yeah. Can you put it in? There you go. Looking good, Marco. Perfect. Perfect. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Borat. Uh, let me introduce uh, a preview of a laser beam scanning solution from uh, a system point for the r 2 display. Uh, first of all, talking about MEMS mirrors, one of the key components in laser beam scanning. Let me give you a brief history of MEMS at ST. As you can see from this chart, basically ST has been developing and selling MEMS for 20 years at least. And uh, we are committed to both sensors and actuators. We are serving several markets and applications. Uh, you can see from uh, consumer, mobile, uh, personal electronics, industrial, automotive, medical, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and uh, for sure we are committed to volumes. As you can see in the bottom part, we shipped to date 19 billion sensor MEMS sensors and 5 billion MEMS actuators in the market. Going uh, a little bit one step down into the details, uh, MEMS actuator technologies. ST is uh, uh, in mass production and is uh, heavily investing in all the MEMS uh, actuator technologies from thermal standpoint for inkjet, printed, dispenser, atomizers, and other kind of fluidic uh, actuators to electrostatic, electromagnetic. Uh, technologies, mostly related to MEMS mirror, and the piezoelectric, where we are heavily investing in the last years for not only MEMS mirror, but also for MEMS speaker, autofocus cameras, and ultrasonic, uh, uh, ultrasound, P-mute uh, components. Talking about MEMS, uh, it's not just having the MEMS uh, actuators, just the muscles, you need also to drive those muscles. So we need also to build and we are committed to provide our customers with a full system with mirror drivers uh, and uh, laser drivers. So we need to drive those actuators. And uh, as I said before, being committed to volumes, we uh, are focusing not only on development, but also on mass uh, volumes manufacturing. So we have two dedicated MEMS fabs uh, in the world, uh, in uh, Milan and Singapore. And we have also two dedicated BCD fabs. I'm just mentioning BCD, that uh, are the most used in terms of our laser beam scanning drivers technology. Uh, so that's very important also in this time of COVID, we see the, the need to provide our customers with second sources and volume manufacturing, because we believe augmented reality, for instance, will be a big volume uh, market where we are investing. Going again, another step down, I would like to show you what we are doing on our MEMS mirrors. That is a key technology, it's a key pillar into the laser beam scanning uh, projectors. And uh, ST here is a wide range of mirror technologies as uh, we are providing our customers with electrostatic, electromagnetic and piezoelectric mirrors, all of them in manufacturing, in uh, mass production, all of them integrated into our uh, MEMS lines production. And uh, thanks to the three technologies, three technologies to provide, uh, to fulfill our customers, our, the requirements of our customers for all their needs, from uh, ultra low power to the need of big displacement, big masses. So we can cover the full spectrum of requirements. And this availability, these capabilities are making ST the undisputed leader in laser beam scanning solution in the market with more than 12 million mirrors already shipped to date. So that's uh, our leadership. We have it and we plan to maintain it. Uh, and that's where it's also uh, showing the, um, the, the, the results into uh, augmented reality. Of course, not only augmented reality, we are investing in LiDAR and other technologies and the uh, recent um, tear down of products in both augmented reality and LiDAR are showing the presence of ST in the market already in an heavily way. And that's the key, I would say, slide of the presentation. I want to, I, I want to give you a preview of what ST is providing. ST is a one-stop shop uh, for uh, laser beam scanning. And uh, as, as you can see on the right side of this slide, I'm uh, focusing on uh, all the components required for uh, laser beam scanning. MEMS mirrors I already discussed about. 
but it's not just MEMS mirror. We develop, we produce mirror drivers for all the technologies I was mentioning, the electrostatic, electromagnetic, and piezo uh, actuation technologies, focusing on performances and uh, uh, power consumption. So energy recovery driver, we have several patents and uh, results already uh, tangible on how to move uh, mirrors with high field of view with ultra low power and very low power. Uh, we also develop dedicated laser diode drivers for uh, augmented reality, in particular to have a 300 picosecond rise time and fall time, three, 300 megahertz pixel clock to provide a true crisp pixel performance uh, with ultra low power characteristics, optimized for augmented reality where the content is sparse and you don't have all the pixel illuminated at the time. So we are really uh, develop, we have developed uh, the power management unit in order to be up and down, let me say, to move from a standby low power condition to full operation in few nanoseconds and being able really to go in ultra low power mode in a few pixels of black pixels, basically. Of course, we provide three and four channels just for RGB driving or RGB plus infrared. And uh, to go down also in the availability and the, the support to our customer, we provide a full system support. So we have developed uh, hardware and software control loops for mirror and for uh, laser. We provide the eye safety, we provide all the required calibration for manufacturing, the video processing, the pre-distortion, uh, temperature pressure compensation, and all those kind of um, support required to uh, develop a full system, not just a component. Uh, and we have all in-house, uh, both for uh, components development and manufacturing, but also at system level, we have our team supporting this portion. Last but not least, we have recently engaged also in the relay optics because of working with our partners, <laughs> as, as Barat was mentioning at the beginning, this is an holistic approach. We have to work from the lasers to the eye. And uh, working with our partners and the waveguides, we have uh, designed and patented a couple of uh, designs uh, to maximize the performances of the coupling between our laser beam coming out from the mirrors and the in-coupling of the waveguide. If you go to the left side of this uh, presentation, this slide, you can see the building blocks. And as I said, out of the laser diodes, for which we rely on our key partner. Uh, and the optics, who are basically in terms of manufacturing, is not as steep to manufacture those parts. All the rest is uh, developed and manufactured by ST. And you see on the bottom side, on the left, uh, an image of uh, a real uh, temple arm reference design, including all our electronics. Those are all ST components and the um, optical engine on the right side, basically, that is generating the, uh, including the laser diodes, the mirror and the optics to provide a beam outside. Talking about the, this uh, optical engine, you can see basically the evolution and that's just a, a preview and the teasing of what will be detailed uh, in the next presentations and what will be presented next year at uh, Photonics West, as SPIE. Basically, we moved from our Pico projector of 1.7 cubic centimeters developed, uh, sold in the market in 2015, uh, for which we built a proof of concept. You can see on the bottom left uh, an example of a proof of concept. It was a technology proof of concept. Then we have today available this new engine. We call it Helen. Uh, you see the, the real image where we are where basically you see a lens coming from the top that is a a collimation lens uh, using uh, for the collimation process there in our labs. So we have built the design of the optical engine. Uh, the dimension of this optical engine is 0 0.75 cubic centimeter, similar performance to the previous Pico projector, but much, much more compact thanks to the three-in-one module uh, from uh, Osram, the laser diode modules. And uh, Thanks to the laser, laser alliance that has been announced uh, two days ago, uh, yesterday, basically we are uh, in increasing our capability with our partners to manufacture the optical engine that we have designed. 
and uh, the capability to go to a final product, so a full pair of glasses that should be available in the market by, by next year. We have a roadmap as well, and it's more than a roadmap. Uh, 2021, we have already most of the components ready. New mirrors, what we call star one here on the right, is an optical engine going to 0 0.65 cubic centimeter, increasing the field of view, increasing the resolution. Most important, it, this will be 50% power consumption versus what we have in the center. And what we have in the center is already much below one watt. That was uh, what Barat was mentioning. So the target is to be below one watt uh, in 2021 with a binocular solution. And this thanks to our thin film piezo mirrors technology and, and the energy recovery thanks to our piezo technology. We have uh, enabled an ultra low power solution uh, providing a very good uh, performance. But stay tuned, I would say, uh, wait for you in the next weeks and months to see the evolution of the Alliance and the evolution of those products. And uh, of course, we are open to, to answer more questions related to those products. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Thank you, Marco, very much. I really appreciate that. That's very illuminating. Uh, great, thank you. Uh, so our, our next speaker is uh, Stefan Morgat from uh, Osram Optus Semiconductors. And for uh, those of you who don't know the call, he's calling it very early his time in Germany. So really appreciate uh, Stefan, you taking the opportunity to be with us. Thank you, Barat, for this introduction. So let me <coughs> share my screen with you. So I hope it's now in presentation mode. Okay. So now let's talk about the, the light source for the laser beam scanning systems. Um, so as you can see here, for laser beam scanning, you need three lasers. So a red, a green, and a blue one. And uh, so far for these laser beam scanning systems, uh, individual packages were used. So it's one package for red, for green, and blue. And uh, mostly were used uh, the so-called TO CAN packages, which are industry standard for laser diodes. But as mentioned before, it's important for near-to-eye or for AR glasses to make the, the projection engine very small. And therefore, there's of course the idea to put all three colors into one package. And uh, you see here a nice example from ST. So on the left side, you see uh, an engine using TO lasers. So you see the illumination unit is quite big due to the big laser packages and the optics you, you need to, to collimate and uh, collect the, the beams. And uh, on the opposite, on, on the right side, you can see what you can achieve by putting all three colors into one laser package. And this is exactly what we are doing now. And um, so here you can see yeah, the, the image of a package. So this is a kind of target specification, uh, which we are now uh, fulfilling already. And um, so this is a very small device. Footprint is only seven millimeter times 4.6 millimeter and the height is 1.2 millimeter. It's an SMD device and it's a so-called top looker. So the RGB beams are emitted to the top and um, this is achieved by using edge emitting lasers, which are placed inside a package with a certain gap in between. So in this case, we have chosen 2.3 millimeter spacing. And for each color or for each beam, a prism is used to deflect the beam from a horizontal to a vertical direction. So to get a top looker device. So there's no beam collimation, no beam uh, combination. And uh, also these arrows you see here is only the optical axis. Of course, as you know, um, as characteristic for edge emitting lasers, the beam is emitting in a kind of cone with an emission angle of seven degrees times about 22 degrees. The power levels are chosen 100 milliwatt for red, 50 for green and 80 for blue. I will come to that on the, on the next slides. Uh, because this is important, of course, you you use the free colors to, to mix the colors. So you can see here the CIE 
1931 uh, color chart where you see the uh, three laser wavelengths of primaries, red, green, blue. And now by operating these three lasers, um, you can get any color within this uh, triangular or triangle. Um, and you have to operate the lasers by applying a forward current above the threshold. And this has to be done in a very short time. So you have only some nanoseconds to achieve a resolution of 720p and a refresh rate of 60 hertz. So the lasers have to be pulsed very fast and very in an exact way to mix the right color for each pixel. And coming back to the brightness, it's always confusing. Optical power, uh, luminous flux, um, luminance. So here's an example to achieve a good or uh, D65 white point, a good balanced white point of 22 lumen. You need about 57 milliwatt of red, 36 of green, and 21 of blue. And um, if you would make a white, full white screen, which is maybe not typical for the application, but uh, it's always for projection or reference, a totally white screen, you need about a power of one watt to the laser diodes. And now coming from a laser diode to the eye, to the user's eye, so this is kind of the optical train. So putting one watt to the laser means you emit about 25 lumen out of a laser. And now assuming 30% efficiency of the optical engine, you get out about 10 lumen. And these 10 lumen are then feed into the optical combiner. And uh, assuming uh, the optical combiner has uh, 100 nits per lumen, you will get 1000 nits to the, to the eye. Uh, so this is an example how the electrical power is transferred to the luminance of the whole glasses. So this, there are some slides about the lasers. Thank you very much. Stefan, thank you so much for that. I really appreciate that. Um, thank you again. Hello, our next uh, speaker is uh, Josh Littlefield from uh, Dispolex. Josh is the Executive Vice President of North America Sales at Dispolex and uh, he'll talk to us about uh, waveguides. Josh, uh, take it away when you're ready. Perfect. You see my slides? Not yet, Josh. Perfect, hold on one second. There we go. Got it, thank you. All right, it's nice to meet everybody. My name is uh, Josh Littlefield and I'm uh, with Displex. I've actually just joined a little over a month ago. So you guys are all stuck with me today. Um, our technical team is more than happy to answer any detailed questions in the future. But until then, like I said, more than happy to, to walk you through where we're currently at. So uh, we're here obviously to talk about diffractive waveguides and LBS. So we at Displex are extremely excited about the overall display industry, and in, in particular, the trajectory of the AR performance innovation. So we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the technology that's currently out. So Birdbath and uh, LCOS and DLP. Um, they have got some amazing technology that's in the marketplace that are leveraging these two tech. Um, Birdbath, um, it does some really good stuff. It's been around for a long time. And the use cases that it's used for, you know, it, it does what it's supposed to do, but it does have limitations. LCOS and, and DLP, um, if you know my background, I actually just joined uh, Displex from Magic Leap. So I am a massive fan of, of the Magic Leap one. Um, I, I, you know, big believer in the technology and, and, and where it's going. Um, as a matter of fact, just uh, earlier this week, uh, Displex put out a press release on our new 30, 40, and 50 degree FOV uh, waveguides that actually support LCOS and DLP. Um, we can go much higher than that on the, on the FOV as well. Um, so we're huge proponents of this te technology. With that being said though, there are some limitations to LCOS and, and DLP. Um, all of us on the call today are here because we are dedicated to helping uh, whether you're a consumer um, or an individual or if you're in the enterprise space or heavy industry or in defense, uh, all of us are committed in bringing augmented reality to everybody. 
And in order to do that, we have to go past some of those limitations. So with laser beam scanning, we, we are able to finally start hitting those issues. Um, and those issues are in form, they're in function, they're in quality, and they're in cost at scale. Um, our goal is to make it so where um, if you're in industry or if you're in enterprise or in defense, that you're focused less on the device that's on your head and focus more on the work that you're doing and leveraging that tool that you're wearing without having to worry about it falling off or where it's at or the weight, things like that. Or if you're a consumer, you wanna be able to look the way you're used to looking, right? So you don't you know, feel out of sorts and that you're able to see what's around and again, not deal with the weight. Um, so we're extremely excited about where laser beam scanning is, is going. Um, again, there's a lot of advantages that come with LBS. Um, higher resolution, lower power, a much better contrast and greater transparency. And then of course, the smaller form factor and the lighter weight. But in order to get there, there's a lot of technical challenges for the waveguides that you have to get over. Coherency in today's laser sources actually contribute to the interference, the speckle, and then of course the compromise image sharpness. And then in order to get smaller, there's optical consequences. We could go on and on and on about all the different challenges that are there to go into the much smaller LBS. Um, with that being said, um, we were able to address that, right? And to conquer the challenges and the, and, and the, the hurdles to go from an LBS in a lab to actually get it ready to be a product. Um, we actually have uh, LBS demos that are out in the wild right now. We have many customers who are coming back to us and telling us exactly where we're at in the industry. Um, a lot of them feel that we are you know, 12 to 18 months ahead of, um, of the marketplace. Our goal is to help our customers have those compact eyewear with really thin temple, really light and thin waveguides, and really have a large eye box that, and, and, and lightweight so people can start wearing it all day. There's a question in the Q&A where um, somebody had asked, you know, what are some of the use cases for all day? There's, we could talk about that for a long time, right? But the big thing is, is that we want to be able to give people, whether you, again, you're a consumer or your enterprise or your defense, help people have the opportunity to choose what use cases they want to use it for. Whether they're using it for five minutes or they're using it for 10 hours, they need to be able to wear it in a way where it's comfortable. And so that's our goal. So how do we do that? Um, I'm a big believer in the Lazar Alliance. In order to have the form, the function, the quality, and the cost at scale, the only way that we can do that is through the right ecosystem. So working with people like ST and Ostrom, Applied Materials, Quanta, and Mega, we were able to you know, address all those major issues to get the product out so then people can start testing and start building for their product's future. Um, there's a lot of complex AR technology components, very individualized components, that everything has to work See, uh, seamlessly. In order to accomplish that, there has to be the collaboration between all of us. Um, and so that's what this uh, partnership has done. So as an example, Applied Materials is the manufacturer of all of our waveguides. Um, we know that whenever we work with them, whether we're doing a standard high quality display or we're doing a custom built or a, an NRE project, um, we know that the production when it actually is manufactured that every single waveguide is of the highest quality. We also know that whatever project that we're working on, whether if it's a, you know, a light engine from Mega um, or we have work with Quanta or ST or, or Ostrom, that every single interaction that they are bringing their best people to allow our customers to be able to actually achieve their goals and their visions. Again, I'm here more on the business side. Although we have a, an, an awful lot of tech technology folks that are more than happy to answer your questions, um, feel free to email me and I'm more than happy to put you in touch with my CTO. Thank you. Thank you so much, Josh. Appreciate that. Perfect segue and great. So yes, you know, we talked about uh, devices so far. And now we need to get into how do you realize these devices into some kind of a, some kind of manufacturer product. So I think it's a great segue to applied materials. So let me uh, introduce to you uh, Nama Algaman, and she's the Director of Product and Marketing at Applied Materials. And she's gonna talk to us about uh, waveguide manufacturing. So Nama, over to you, please. Hey, thank you so much, Ross. Uh, and thank you, Josh, for the kind words. Can you see my screen here? Yeah, looks good. All right, so let's start with a short video, if it works. 
Your smartphone is a computer that's millions of times more powerful, 40,000 times smaller, and 16,000 times less expensive than the first mainframe computer. And there are more than 2.5 billion in use today. How did that happen? Industrial scale. Every year, nearly 30 million wafers are processed for smartphones. Each 300 millimeter wafer contains hundreds of chips, all meeting the same rigorous specifications. Applied's world-leading expertise in materials engineering and building equipment to manufacture chips has made this industrial scale possible. In partnership with our customers, we continue to make chips faster, more energy efficient, and more affordable. Today, our systems touch virtually every chip and display made. Even after more than 50 years of creating new possibilities for our customers to embrace, we're just getting started. The world is moving rapidly into an era of self-driving cars, robotic manufacturing, the Internet of Things, virtual reality, and more. Digital devices are becoming extensions of ourselves, sharpening our vision, deepening our insights, and enriching our experiences. These devices will be powered by a new generation of chips, requiring new materials and new ways to build them. Applied Materials is at the forefront of making this new world possible. Come join us. Right. 2.5 billion smartphones in use today. They're made on over 30 million wafers per year. So Applied's industrial scale materials engineering has made smartphones ubiquitous. And imagine a world where this industrial scale is used to put augmented reality glasses on every face. Applied is the world number one semiconductor and display equipment company, investing over $2 billion a year in R&D. And with 21,000 people across the globe, all these people develop an incredible variety of materials engineering technologies in deposition, etch, patterning, filling and removing layers at an atomic precision using cutting edge robotics, control and software. Applied technology is in every phone, every TV, and every electronic device in the world. And we are committed to bringing this technology to the next wave of innovation in photonics devices, including AR. Our group within Applied called Engineered Optics, where am I? <laughs> is using all the breadth and depth of capabilities developed within Applied Materials for the semiconductor industry and applying it into optics. For the first time in history, the semiconductor industry can now fabricate deep sub-wavelength features in high quality optical materials to open up new possibilities in an industry that is on the verge of inflection. And we're developing our technology on 300 millimeter platform. But Applied has been making glass equipment for over 20 years in our display business. And today builds Gen 10 display tools and roll to roll platforms that we could leverage in the future, which gives us a huge flexibility as we look into the future. Within our group, we have a large team developing these capabilities over quite some time now, and we will soon be ready to launch a real product. And here, are two of the first two applications that we're looking at, surface relief grading waveguides for augmented reality and flat lenses for consumer electronics. And you can see two 300 millimeter wafer examples below. On the left are our high index etch waveguides demonstrating the best performance we have seen to date on a single sheet, lightweight and thin substrate. On the right, our near infrared lenses for 3D sensing, demonstrating over 90% efficiency. Deep sub wavelength optics is a big inflection that we believe will enable new emerging industry. It's bigger than waveguides, it's bigger than simple lenses. We expect many more applications to come and revolutionize the way we see optics. We are already getting interest for new applications, so if you think you could use our platform, my contact info is at the end. But we're not done working on waveguide technology. Engineered Optics has developed a unique set of capabilities in order to push waveguide performance forward. First of all, our ability to process 300 millimeter transparent substrates with high quality films at over 2.0 index and etched waveguides push the envelope on productivity, reliability, 
but most important, image quality. We developed slanted structures that increase the wave guide efficiency and by that allow for lower power consumption by the light engine and true all day wearable glasses, even in daylight. Our meta surfaces could reduce relay optics form factor. Our local area processing and gradient features increase the image quality and color uniformity. And we can do all that with double-sided processing to allow for a single sheet while maintaining a wild field of view. And you can see our inline wafer flipper in the center bottom image. And thin, lightweight wafers with nanostructures patterns don't travel well. And that's why we have invested in a fully automated back end line to drive singulation, high index edge black and stacking as needed. And with all, all that, with, huge, with high index films that are inorganic and low haze deposited on a mature semiconductor process. So you can leave your smart glasses on your car dashboard in a hot summer day without worrying about yellowing or delamination. Applied 300 millimeter silicon platform is mature and most advanced, processing today's five nanometer features. But processing substrates other than silicon require a whole new thinking on mechanics, optics, chemistry, physics. Engineered optics as part of applied materials has developed custom tools over several years to build a full suite of equipment that enables all process steps on transparent substrates. This is why Applied is uniquely positioned to drive high volume manufacturing in the space. The platforms we're using are mature, high productivity, high yield, and we take advantage of 50 years of materials engineering expertise from our parent company while building a strong optics team to bring out our dedicated metrology and characterization tools for waveguides. In comparison, Nano imprint technologies are still lagging. Uh, they're not used at scale today, and we see them as a risk. We offer wafer services from GDS files all the way to yielded parts, and on any scale, from prototyping to millions of units per year, all having high volume manufacturing in mind. And if you'd like to learn more on what we're doing, our GM, Wayne McMillan, will give a fireside chat to this forum in December, and I encourage you to attend. Okay, Nama, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, uh, thank you very much. So along those themes uh, of, uh, you know, uh, higher laser integration. So we talked about uh, we've got manufacturing. Uh, next, uh, our speaker is uh, Makoto Masuda, Masuda-san. He's yes. the Chief Operating Officer and the Chief Technology Officer at Mega One. And he'll talk to you about how do you bring it all together? How do you bring in all the various components together uh, into a into a compact optical light engine. So, Masuda-san, please uh, take over. Uh, thank you. Uh, is it clear? It's very clear, Masuda-san. Uh, thank you. Uh, good evening. My name is Masuda. Uh, I am CEO of Mega One. I will start the presentation of Mega One. Uh, Thanks, SPRA and ST Micro invited Mega One to join the SPI webinar section. Uh, here is the agent that I would like to share with. Number one, Mega One capability. Number two, factory tour. Number three, LBS AR technology. Number four, low rolling laser. At first, uh, Mega One capability. Mega One is the department of Mega Force which specialized in plastic and composite material injection. Mega One spin off in 2055 and cooperate with ST Micro since then. We calibrated closely with ST Micro MEMS technology team to discover laser optical engine. We gradually gained the mass production for high precision manufacturing and process handling. I joined Mega One, which in my knowledge, laser is the perfect solution AR for AR. Mega One was honored to be part of ST Micro Laser Alliance system. Mega One designed our own automation system and on the key of collimator laser and position the optical element. Next, uh, second, factory tour. 
Here, I would like to introduce our production line, which give you better idea of Mega One factory floor. Uh, from where label part, we receive dye bond, wire bonding, an optical part AC, and collimation and calibration. And to form an optical engine, uh, from we, we had to an uh, optical engine, all by self-designed AOI automation equipment. All process is done by automation from our talent team members. And we are proud to announce that. Uh, next, uh, LBS AR technology. Um, Mega One has the ability to do optical simulation familiar with optical and electric parts, supply chains, as well as image quality evolution. In other words, optical design and core board development and its evolution are possibly, possible. Uh, Mega One can also tune image quality based on them. Therefore, Mega One can provide the most stable laser module system for customers. We also specialize in ultra precision manufacturing that uh, cumulative the experience in Mega One for 10 years. Uh, final page. Uh, role in Laser Alliance. And Mega One role in the laser system is the mass production manufacture of laser optical engine. Uh, as well as we have the ability to evolve the image quality and fine tune with our key supplier, which are ST and Oslam and Displex. Mega One glad to devote our strength on compact design and precision manufacturing ability for our customers. Uh, thanks for SPI and ST Micro event, invite Mega One to join the section. Uh, wish you have a nice evening. Thanks. So, San, thank you so much for that. I appreciate it. And final last, but by no means least, is our last speaker. Uh, let me introduce him to you. Uh, so, uh, Yun Cheng Yu is a Senior Director, Optical Engineering Division at uh, Quantum Computer. And like a lot of other panelists, he's also making sacrifices on vacation today, actually, <laughs> up in the hills. But he has uh, kindly, uh, kindly uh, accepted to, uh, to participate here. Uh, and so, uh, YC, I will uh, leave it over for you to uh, do your presentation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Paras. Thank you, Marco. Thank you uh, for SPIE and to hold this uh, event. It's uh, my honor and pleasure to join. So today, uh, uh, I would uh, talk about more about the near eye display for the head mount display and uh, the smart glasses as a system point of view. The first page, I would like to uh, categorize uh, the two, the, the, the whole uh, near eye display into two groups. One is the uh, head mount display, uh, like the uh, HoloLens 1, Meta, MetroDeep. And the second is the smart glasses, uh, leading by usual the, the, the Google glasses. And uh, there's a uh, Epson Music, Focal, and the North Glass 2. And uh, we have a uh, uh, Unreal coming. And uh, based on my observation for the head mount display, there is an emerging trend. Uh, there is a customization for uh, a professional occupation. It is a very good thing since uh, you could see all of this product is uh, come from a uh, uh, technology uh, design from a uh, uh, company uh, train. Uh, but uh, now we got a new requirement, the real demand from the customer side. It's a good thing for the uh, a whole AR market. And the second is uh, uh, we have a trend from the uh, smart glasses. Uh, uh, we have tracing uh, for the, uh, to make the smart glasses like a normal glasses. 
and a new uh, uh, now uh, there's a uh, more and more uh, material technology uh, for example we have the uh, applied material to join to manufacture the wave sky is a good thing and uh, we have a uh, uh, micro array uh, it could re it could make the unreal this kind of product uh, available and uh, the best thing is uh, we have a, a laser beam scanning it is a uh, belief it could make uh, the laser the spark glass is real and uh, this is uh, a near eye display for for professional purpose so we got the uh, requirement uh, the real demand from the doctor from a, a warehouse worker from a, a firefighter however uh, they start they start their uh, research they start to explore their requirement from a uh, hard end actually but uh, while they're thinking about their uh, what ideal uh, uh, DI display they would like to have they think about it should be match their occupational image. For a doctor, they would like to uh, something like a, a, a surgical headline like this. And uh, for a warehouse worker, they need to wear the safety helmet. For a firefighter, a no, 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 there's a, they need a facial mask. So uh, for the field of view requirement, is uh, around 30 to 50. Is a uh, uh, Singapore for the camera and the sensor requirement. It is a very interesting. For a doctor, they need they, they don't need uh, so many sensors. They just want to connect to their endoscope. And uh, even more, they would like happy to see if uh, we could add a LED headlight on this uh, headlight display. And uh, for a uh, a uh, warehouse worker or a postman, they need a barcode scanning to uh, scan uh, their uh, stock. And uh, they even think about if uh, we could have a precision measure uh, of the uh, the box, the kit box. Uh, for a firefighter, they need a thermal camera. For a police, they need a high definition camera. and. Uh, Especially, they may require the facial detection. And uh, but the smart glasses is the most wanted uh, during this time of period. And uh, of course, uh, we joined this uh, uh, SPIE uh, for this forum. It's uh, especially for the smart glasses. And uh, uh, beyond uh, those uh, factors, talk from uh, Baras, we I want to elaborate more. For glasses, we are looking for a prescription lens, is embedded or uh, attached up, attachable. And uh, for glasses, we hope uh, there's a foldable hinge. And uh, since uh, the glasses is a uh, one factor of the personal image, so uh, it's a changeable stylish visor, or maybe a changeable frame. And the near eye display is play, uh, is dominate the whole form factor of the, of the smart glasses. And uh, we believe uh, the laser beam scanning can make the slimmest uh, temple. You could see uh, this uh, part near the frame. It could be uh, further reduced if uh, we apply the laser beam scanning. And uh, here, I would like to talk about well, uh, design uh, smart glasses. Uh, you could image, you may, it's just only one inch, uh, the optical engine. It could uh, happen the interference, interference of the human head. Normally, we would like to have the ref angle uh, to have a, a nice look of the glasses. But with the uh, ref angle and the, the Optical engine, if the lens goes to uh, 34 millimeters, it will happen the uh, interference. But if uh, we reduce the, uh, we, we keep the rep angle to zero, uh, if keep the uh, optical engine lens to uh, 34 millimeters, 
it uh, the gap between the engine and the head head is uh, still very small. It's uh, very impossible to make a glasses. So we could see how important of the uh, optical engine effect the form factor of the glasses. This page I would like to share. Uh, there's a hinge a consideration. If uh, you could see the A, the uh, picture A, the hinge is close to the uh, frame and with the shorter length of the optical engine. So the open angle of the temple is uh, larger than the picture B. It's uh, very important since uh, uh, the head, the head width is a, a global feeding consideration. It's a, a technical a turn. It's not a, a outlook. It's not just the outlook. We need to think about uh, the head width range. And uh, in the middle column, we could see uh, we change the location of the hinge. Uh, for example, C is the ideal case. It's a normal glasses case. However, you need to break the optical engine and the uh, upwave guide. You need to break the optical pad. It is uh, very critical to align a very good uh, uh, incline angle to the wave guide. However, this structure will break the rule. So it is very, very challenging for design a smart glasses. Normally, we will check the scenario D uh, to, you, to, to, to fix the optical engine to the wave guy. Uh, however, you, you need to reduce, uh, you, you need to control the optical engine size. If, uh, uh, if uh, we, we, we just uh, use a single module uh, along with the uh, micro uh, processor board, the, the whole optical engine module would be very long. So you would like the scenario E is uh, not good for the outlook of the glasses. So with the small form factor laser beam scanning, it could it is a very easy to make the hinge uh, to accommodate the most uh, global head width. So Quanta is a uh, uh, commit to uh, AR glasses. We have uh, experience uh, of the near eye display technology. We have the proven a record of the optical engine production, and uh, we are trying to uh, establish the uh, laser beam scanning production. Uh, work with ST now, so it, we we believe uh, with the laser beam scanning uh, technology, we could uh, make uh, smart glasses just look like a normal glasses, and uh, we also uh, work. Uh, for a head mount display and a smart glasses production. Uh, we, have, we, we, we have a very, uh, we have five years experience uh, working on this part. And so we could do a very good uh, design review for a good uh, global fitting, uh, simulation, uh, is a, a drop simulation, thermal simulation, and the manufacturing can appreciate and everything about AI. Of course, we could support uh, a prescription mass uh, customization because uh, everyone's uh, prescription is not the, the same. So we we would we are uh, establishing a system to control this kind of uh, prescription lens. Once we got the prescription uh, from you and order from you, and we target to send you the whole AR glasses within ten days, is a challenge of the operation and uh, of the whole uh, supply chain, I will like commit to do that. And uh, thank you, thank you for your time. Thank you very much, YC, really appreciate it. Again, thank you for being available on your holiday. So that concludes the, uh, the main, uh, the, the, the presentation portion of, uh, of, uh, of uh, our session today. Let me turn my video on here so you can all see me. So, um, so again, once again, thank you to the panelists. You know, this is a bit of a challenge. We tried to allocate everyone 10 minutes per session. So really time for Q&A. It's uh, quite challenging to try to compress all this information into such a small uh, 
time frame, but I think you did a, did a pretty good job. So, uh, you know, so thank you for that. Uh, clearly, you know, there's a lot more to discuss. Uh, and again, the idea of this session was to give you a little bit of a teaser on a preamble or a PV for next year. So hopefully it will excite you enough to not only come next year, but also in the interim to ask and feel any questions and also join the Alliance. So, you know, uh, as we've been going along, I've been, uh, I, as well as others, uh, other speakers here have been trying to answer the questions. So we answered as many as you could in real time. So that was, uh, that was pretty, uh, you know, interesting way of working, which I like, I must say. Uh, and so I think I'll take this time to answer, answer some questions live as well. In particular, uh, surprisingly, lots and lots and lots of questions of microvision. I, uh, I didn't quite expect that, which is, which is a good thing, by the way. I, I mean that in a good way. I think you heard in the outset that, uh, that uh, panel mentioned that I was at microvision as well in the past. Oh, it's a great company. I actually have great technology. And so I can't answer every single question. There's too many answers here. But, uh, but uh, the general theme is pretty clear. So what I'll, what I'll say is the following. Uh, ST and migration are very close parts. We have been for a long time and continue to be. Uh, they're very important to us. They're a customer and they're a partner. And uh, we really enjoy uh, the collaboration and the partnership. Obviously, I can't disclose to you any more details about business arrangements or technologies or product roadmaps or investments and those kind of things. Obviously, as you can imagine, it's not something that uh, we can address. But suffice it to say, there are continue to be a very strong and close partnership of ours uh, across the board. And uh, the question of I'll join the alliance, as I mentioned earlier to you, the alliance is just formed and created. It is not a closed alliance. It is a, it's, it's a growing alliance. In fact, I look at the audience, I don't look at you, but I look at you virtually, uh, or you know, look at you and I look to you to, to, to see if you have an interest uh, into joining and participating, you're all welcome as well. And so as more companies uh, join and show interest, we will publish that more and more. Uh, this is an open tent. This is not a closed tent. So we really welcome the ecosystem to be uh, more enriched so we all can collectively accelerate a product market development and uh, really drive the consumer market so we can draw the volumes we need to be and we can all benefit. So hopefully, if, if you have any other further questions about microvision and how it fits in and without you know, any of the detailed financial type of questions, uh, please uh, you know, send me an email and we'll be happy to uh, have a discussion with you offline about that. Um, Pamela, are you still there? Yep, I'm here. Oh, good, good. Yeah, just weigh in and jump in. So I want to make sure I follow the process. Yeah, do you want to bring everybody on here? Hey, Josh. Absolutely. Bring everybody yeah, on Josh, here. Absolutely. Bring everybody on. And, uh, Thank you. Do you want to, we want to discuss amongst ourselves maybe some of the things that, uh, I don't know, I think we get to have fun in the last, you know, 18 minutes here. Absolutely. Um, we got lots of questions. Is there anything that anybody would like to, you know, to, to address. Like you guys, thank you so much. That was fantastic talks and uh, very important for our industry. And uh, I can't tell you how much activity that we've had, whether chat and even in the background here. So lots of activity, so thank you. But yeah, do you have any comments? I'll let you sort of guide that breath if there's anything else. Sure, so let me sort of go around the table here, if I will, for comments first. Uh, I'll go in the order which you went, uh, Marco, do you have any comments? You've seen a lot of the questions as well. We have to answer every single question here, but certainly you can address your comments uh, generally if you'd like, or just, you know, you can have fun. That's not too much fun, but some fun, you know. Yeah, thank you. I, again, I see lots of questions around augmented reality about the uh, what's next. Uh, as uh, as uh, discussed today, we put in place a, a uh, an alliance to enable the market first and to provide the right components in mass production. So best players on the table, more to come. Uh, to answer some of the questions, uh, prescription lenses can be embedded into uh, waveguides. I saw that. Uh, in terms of ST components, we are committed and we have already mass production MEMS mirrors. We have in mass production all the components. So we are ready already to start beginning of the next year. We have already this year in mass production products. There are questions on uh, where we are. There are uh, lots of, I would say, teardowns just coming out last weeks, two weeks, I would say, on uh, augmented realities and on uh, uh, LiDAR. So I will not disclose. You can buy those reports and find if who is there in terms of mirrors. That could be interesting. <laughs> I have no other comments from my side. Right. Thank you, Marco. Appreciate it. Uh, uh, then I think after you came Stefan. Stefan, uh, I would like to give you, you know, the floor for a minute or two if you make comment and or respond. 
Yeah, so far I saw no question regarding the laser, so I'm just... Shocked, right? Yeah, <laughs> I think, I guess it's <laughs> obvious, you did a great job. <laughs> Same on us, that must be it. Not sure. Okay, very good. And then uh, yeah, Josh, uh, I think you were after uh, Stefan. You responded to some of the uh, questions and thank you for that. Do you have any uh, comments or anything to add? Uh, no, I think that if there's any specific questions regarding waveguides, just feel free to send me an email and more than happy to put you in touch with the right folks and look forward to talking to everybody. Great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Nama, I think same thing for you, you answered the question as well. I appreciate that. Do you have any comments or questions? I, want to give the... I, I saw a question in the general chat asking about our slant, uh, mm -hmm. slant features uh, tool. Mm -hmm. So I want to answer on that one. Um, this one is very special because we had to build a platform for Scratch just, just for this market. Um, it's very, very unique. Uh, and we have um, high throughput in mind, right? Because we all want to keep costs low. So we're, we've developed something especially for this market and we're, we're using it wherever we can. Terrific. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Masuda-san, uh, any comments for you? Uh, any, anything you oh, want to add? Thank you very much. Uh, I have no questions. Uh, okay. I, I'm glad to uh, meet you. Thank you very much. Very good. And uh, YC, last but not least, any comments or questions? Or from a list of questions you I, had? I, or? I, see, I see a little question about a uh, prescription. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, now, make I could answer easily. Now we are thinking about is something like a sandwich. To uh, one one method is uh, to laminate uh, the prescription onto the web guide, but it's uh, dangerous. It might in, uh, interference with some microstructure on the, in the web guide. And uh, uh, the other the other method is uh, air bound uh, to to keep uh, to to leave uh, about point three millimeter uh, air gap in between, and uh, another a uh, protection glass in the front is a normal structure. So it's a uh, it's a undergoing now. I think uh, every uh, a smart glasses maker is designed like this way. So mm -hmm. it's on the way. Great, thank you so much. Now I won't speak out of turn for Dispolex or Applied Materials, but I'm sure you guys are thinking about this as well. And so it's a great question. Uh, there's, some, there's some stuff going on that we probably can't talk about. Maybe next year at the conference, we'll have more to talk about. Uh, but I think it's a great question. It's an obvious question. And you know, clearly, if you can't do prescription, why bother, right? And so I think everyone knows that pretty well. And so uh, and we are looking at that. And I'm sorry, we can't give you more details that you want to hear now. But uh, suffice it to say that uh, there's quite a bit of uh, quite a bit of technology uh, technology development around that. Uh, okay, then a few more questions. You now we have a little, little bit more time. I do want to you know be mindful of this. I got somebody. Well, I've unfortunately typed their name just kind of like ASSSSD. I'm not sure who they are, but anyway, it's fine. The yeah, interesting question: How does this group plan to navigate around the current pandemic? Is there a bigger sense of urgency concerning reaching a product ready for market? Great question. The cool thing is, a lot of us have not met face to face in this in, in this alliance. In fact, right? None of us have. I mean, I mean Stefan, I know from I'm a pseudo son, but you know, Nama, for example, and Josh, we haven't met face to face. You know, Mark hasn't met those guys, so you know, we haven't met face to face. But yet, we we're able to get an alliance together, able to collaborate, able to do things. You know, as uh, as Pamela mentioned, the Dispolex team is in Finland, the development team. Uh, you know, applied team is in, of course, California. You know, YC and the Quanta team is in uh, is in Taiwan. Masuda-san in Japan and Taiwan, and Stefan is in Rendsburg in Germany. Uh, and then Marco's team is in Israel, and Milan. Uh, no one can travel, but guess what? We're getting stuff done. So it's been interesting, right? We were able to navigate around it. And just this call alone, I was a little nervous about having a conference call with so many people and. But it's pretty smooth by and large, I think, anyway. So I think, you know, it's navigated well. Sense of urgency, yes. What I would say, what we're seeing is that we're seeing a lot more interest in remote work, obviously, because of, uh, of COVID. And as we extend COVID more and more, these kind of tools, having AR glasses and having these kind of tools is uh, gaining a lot more interest, uh, both in the public press as well as in the, techn the technology press. So I would say that, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say necessarily urgency, but I would say acceleration for sure in terms of having these kind of tools and assets uh, available to the general marketplace at large, is, is what I would say. Uh, question for AMAT. <laughs> AMAT lady, okay. <laughs> AMAT lady. <laughs> uh, it says, are you using the high index wafer for the waveguide meta lens? 
products? So this is an interesting question because um, it's not a question for, or it's, it's partly a question for us, but it's a question for, for the Alliance because there is a very tight feedback between the design and manufacturing and the system consideration and architecture. So um, the choice of which type of glass to use for each one of our products is actually, it's a collaboration between all the members working on productizing this technology. Um, we cannot do this alone. We cannot dictate, all right, we're only, only going to use this and nothing else. Um, it all comes from system consideration. It goes up and down the value chain through a lot of feedback and collaboration. And for each type of waveguide and each type of metasurface that we make, it has its own, its own substrate. That's a great answer. And that just goes back to the same theme throughout. We have to design the system together holistically. That's really what you're, you're referring to as well. And if we don't do that, then, it, then we will we'll sub-optimize everywhere. And so it's really important to look at the requirement top down and then partition the sub requirements into the, into the necessary subsystems, right? And, and, and sort of, you know, uh, sort of a waterfall it down is a way to really do things. And so um, hopefully answers your question. Uh, I'll give this one to Marco, even though I could uh, answer it, I want him to talk. Uh, Marco, does the LBS have a resolution loss problem? Yi Xing had that question. Marco, are you, are you on mute, Marco? Yeah, I am muted. So, sir, sorry. So basically, for uh, laser beam scanning, we are able to target different resolution. And uh, I take the same answer that was just given, basically. Resolution is part of the problem. It's part of the challenge, not the problem. It's uh, when we are working, uh, the laser beam scanning itself is providing the re resolution given by the resonance frequency of the mirrors and the dimension of the mirror. Bigger mirror is giving smaller spot, higher resolution. We are providing already to the market to some custom uh, developed uh, products for key customers. We are already providing 100 degrees field of view diagonal with one, uh, 1080p resolution, laser beam scanning. Then you need to combine this with the, all the optical path uh, up to the waveguides and up to the eye. So there are for sure trade-offs in all this system development. And uh, I take exactly what Naama was saying before. It's a matter to work at system level. And it's interesting because uh, what I loved participating to the technical discussions is to see the team in Osram working with the team of ST and the team of Dispelix and uh, we'll make a one together to simulate the full system and validate, uh, first of all, the, specific, the, the, the performances and second, the manufacturability of what we are doing. So having at the table uh, applied material and uh, it's, uh, we are talking about manufacturability, volumes uh, and quality. So that's, uh, I, I hope I'm answering there. Yeah. That's a very good, very, very good. Again, it's the same theme, right? Marco and team, right? Again, I go back to that spiderweb diagram. You have to look at the total system optimization holistically, and that is really the key. I think it's most important. Um, thank you, Marco. That thing is a very good answer. Uh, let's have some fun, maybe some fun questions. You, you told us to have fun, right, Pamela? Okay, so let's have some fun. What are those particular requirements, <laughs> criteria for joining the Laser Alliance? Okay. Well, to me, you know, we are very open. Uh, I, I, will, I will quote uh, Henry Ford. You can have any... You can have any micro display you want as long as laser beam scanning, you know. And so, uh, and so the only the only uh, requ requirement is, of course, it's a laser beam scan, uh, laser beam scan architecture. But we certainly welcome, uh, you know, all companies that are that are really uh, engaged in that space. Um, I think I have one or two more questions as well. Uh, let's see. Um, so I'm just, I'm just looking through over here. How is your group partner economically? Will we make strategic investments together? Again, I will take that one quickly. Uh, this is a collection of like-minded collaborative companies, right? This is not financial commitments. We're not asking people to make and buy and sell things. However, we all see a common interest. We all see a, a, a common value. We all recognize each other's assets. We all believe that we can collectively define, build and grow the market. 
Uh, and so, you know, and so that's the approach we take over here. And so we're not partnering economically from that perspective. I and mean, certainly we care about costs. We certainly talk about costs. We want to make sure the costs are, are consistent with the marketplace we'll want. And we all do our portions to manage and control costs. And as Nama and Marco uh, pointed out, we look at the system and architecture and all the aspects to make sure manufacturability, the costing, the volumes and everything are there. But other than that, there is no direct there is no direct uh, economic uh, economic type of uh, type of incentive. Um, okay, fun question. YC, somebody else. Fun question for YC. Yang Ching Liu, where are you currently broadcasting from? <laughs> oh, I'm in a, a hotel of a, a south part of Taiwan. So okay. it's a it's a holiday village. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the fun question. I like that. Uh, very good. Um, let's see. For somebody else over here. Who else? Where is everybody presenting from? I think everybody tell where they're presenting from. So we have. Oh, sorry, yes. Roth, you're in California. Yep, right behind me is the Golden Gate Bridge. You see, I'm outside enjoying the bridge now. It's, it's a backdrop I have in San Francisco, yes. Thank We're in you. Bellingham, Washington, just between Vancouver, British Columbia, and Seattle. Right. And I think, Marco, you're just south of me, right? I'm in Redmond, Washington. Okay. Just moved here three years ago from Italy. Oh, very nice. Josh? Los Angeles. And this, uh, Stefan? Yeah, I'm in Zurich, Switzerland. Yeah. Oh, it doesn't look good. Very nice. Nama? I'm in the South Bay, California. Okay. Nice. I think yeah, Stefan wins on that it's one o'clock in the morning. Wait. Uh, no, no, no. It's more like uh, two, four o'clock. 2.30. Two, two <laughs> two yeah. okay, okay, good. Well, um, so I hope everybody appreciates uh, that all of these people came together today to really have this impressive um, session. Brath, is there anything else or anybody else that have any questions? I think I have a couple things just to wrap up. Or no, I think, think? We're, we're within the time. I think, uh, look, I appreciate all the questions. I apologize if we can't answer everything. We try to go as fast as we can without losing sight of the conference and typing. We didn't want to take away attention. So thank you, all the panelists. Thank you for your questions. Uh, you hopefully, have all of our emails. If you don't, we'll, you know, we'll have it at the end of our presentation. That'll be loaded up. You can get it from there. Uh, but please feel free to reach out to any of us, right? We want to hear from you, actually. We'd love to hear your ideas. Uh, even controversial ones are okay. You know, we love to engage in conversation. So uh, please feel free uh, to reach out to us and, uh, and let's connect. And look, uh, the last I'll leave is following, right? The market is still not there yet, right? We all say it is. It's a lot of hype out there. We know it's, we all believe. We're all investing lots of money, lots of time, every one of us here and others. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we have to work together collectively as industry to bring things to, to come together. A lot of questions about competitors. What do you think of L cost and this and that? I like everybody. I want everyone to succeed, right? We have to grow the market and build the market. That's really important. And the view we take as alliance, as alliance and as individual companies and individuals, so we want the market to grow. And, and thrive because that is really the most important thing. So, so thank you for your participation, everybody. And thank you for your, uh, you know, for your attention and your questions. Please continue the conversation. Uh, please uh, continue to see all the SPI. Great job, Pamela, and all the talks you have in the Fireside Chats. Now I mentioned one to you uh, coming up with Wayne McMillan at the, in January, for, in December, for example, and others. So stay tuned, participate in there, come to the Photon Specs next year. And above all, engage, reach out, don't be shy. Thanks, Brent. That's exactly it. I, I, I'm so uh, just proud that Bernard and I were able to start this, what, in 2017, 2018, and really sort of driving this, this forward. I mean, we're not there yet, but I think this, how we've brought all of, you know, we're, we're competitors, we're partners, but everybody's working on this together. And I just, I couldn't be more proud and honored to work with everybody that I work with. So, so thankful that we're all working together to, for the XR hardware. Um, and yeah, I'm just looking forward to the next event. So this, it doesn't stop here. You know, I'll, I'll just share my screen. We've got a few more things coming up here. So there we go. Yeah. So in October, we're going to be interviewing Lucas with Bosch. We've got Wayne coming up. Um, we've got Mike Brown, Mike Lee with Compound Photonics, Bernard. He always gives a great, if anybody hasn't done any of the fireside chats, please join because Bernard always gives a really great quick update of what's going on in the industry overall. And so that's always great. And then we'll also have other interviews going on. There's also other workshops going on as well. Um, so I don't, I guess if I didn't share my screen, but here, here is uh, all the sessions coming up. Um, so yeah, join any of these and then check the website back, you know, always check the website. There's more workshops, you know, Brath, there's a whole 
we're going to have a, a, a one day workshop on this uh, in March. And um, so there is two, and just so you know, there's two conferences. We have the Photonics West and then the ARVR conference is separate. So you'll be able to attend both, no problem, but join in. Again, we're in this together. And I really appreciate everybody joining tonight and uh, look forward to working with you more in the future. So Thank you, Pamela. And hey, my fellow speakers, guys, thank you so much. And particularly the guys overseas, thank you so much. And particularly, Stefan, thank you so much. We really appreciate all thank of you guys. Thank you. thank you so much, guys. Stay well, and, uh, stay safe, yes, and look indeed. forward to seeing you again very soon. Right. Indeed. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.